First question, Mr. Samard. Thanks, Kelly. Um, my question is for uh, Admiral Cairns. And something that uh, Admiral Moffat said uh, resonated with me, and that is, uh, to paraphrase, um, if you want to prevent losing the capability to build ships, don't stop building. Um, we in Canada, you know, since our last program with the CPF, we stopped the building. Okay. Uh, we are now on the National Shipbuilding uh, Procurement pro er, uh, Program, where we will space our ships out a little bit more to, uh, to gain a little more time and expertise. Um, but what's missing in this entire equation, in my mind, is export. And if you look at the shipyards in the Netherlands, like Daman, in France, like DCNS, in Germany, like TKMS, I would wage that those shipyards would not be around today if they weren't exporting, right? That's how you keep building. And I'd like to uh, hear your perspective, sir, on you know, what we should be doing and what we are doing in our shipbuilding industry here in Canada to develop those export sales. Thanks very much. Um, NSPS, starting there with NSPS, was designed, the original design of NSPS, which no one's paid any attention to. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Pilot to Bombardier. Okay. The, uh, the original uh, concept behind NSPS was to, in actual fact, put in a long-term building program. And the idea was that ships would be spaced out uh, so that there was sanity to the building process and it just kept going and going and going and notwithstanding uh, Mr. Kibben's issues with uh, small, small runs, uh, you would have many small runs but uh, it would be stretched out over time. What is actually appears to be happening now is everybody's running to the gate to build every one of these classes as quickly as it possible can, possibly can. And if we're not careful, we're going to end up with uh, in a big valley. We'll just have had one hell of a lot of fun for 10 or 20 years, but we'll be back to nothing again if we're not careful. So, you know, that's got to be looked at. And that was not the real intention of the program. Uh, the, uh, there is an organization called SDTC. Does everybody, anybody know a bit about them? Uh, they're coming to the framework here. I got some notes on them, but uh, uh, they're the Sustainable Development Technology Canada. Uh, they've got lots of funding for entrepreneurial people who are trying to uh, to help them export, and they've been doing this now. They've been using. Um, value propositions for 13 or 14 years, and they have actually built uh, uh, really good uh, decision trees to be able to select the right kind of technologies to invest in to, to export. Um, my point here is, is that there is, uh, you know, wherewithal to do that, wherewithal to take advantage of these people. Now, whether we can do that with a a ship or just the components, in other words, we help the suppliers or we, or we try and uh, sell a whole ship. I think selling warships is hard. I was involved with the Canadian Patrol Frigate when we tried to sell it uh, into the Middle East. I was involved with the, with the uh, Pickett's Charge in Saudi Arabia. And um, we didn't actually uh, you know, achieve very much there. There are reasons for that. Uh, you need to get firm government support. When, you'd send, when you sell a ship, particularly a warship, it's almost got to be a government-to-government -government deal. And uh, people want to have the assurance that the, the Canadian government backs uh, the, the money they're going to invest in, in, in our country. Um, Damon, on the other hand, is a classic example of a shipyard that gets, uh, looks at uh, where designs are needed and goes out and does it. And they've... Uh, they've um, you know, built a heck of a reputation. What I mean, they're building half our ships. Or, you know, we're, they're building, uh, um, I think they're going to be building uh, offshore supply vessels for one of Irving's companies. They're, going to, they're building uh, ferries for um, uh, the TransLink people who use the ferry from north to uh, North Vancouver to Vancouver proper. Um, and I believe that we can do that. You know, I think we can do that. We, uh, 
we have a, a, a designer who designs tugs and he's got any number of tugs being built in the world somewhere but not in Canada. Why can't they be built in Canada? Why can't we compete to get a certain, you know, a percentage of those? It's a, I think much as it's an attitudinal change and much is that uh, you have to be able to uh, fight through and want to do it. Um, I don't know, uh, there's only I think one shipyard at the moment who is showing an entrepreneurial spirit to go out and beat the, uh, beat the pants off anybody and try and sell all around the world, and that's Davy. Now they're, they're new in the game, they're just reconstituted again, but I think that they have a, an opportunity to do that. So that's about the best answer I can give you. But I think that it's something we should do. Oh, one thing about SDDC. They have proven to themselves that uh, when you want to leverage capability from a military program, you can leverage a lot of what you do in the military program to the commercial world. And that can, can, that can provide a shipyard or a company with a significant uh, market for quite a long period of time. So that's another area that we need to be looking at. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. My name is Ferit Kerko, CDAI. And uh, throughout the comments of, by Kelly and then Admiral Moffitt and Admiral Cairns, there's something very, very worrisome in terms of a common thread is what Navy for what? And one has the impression that we're going to build ship, but we still don't have a clear policy as to what we're going to do. And actually, that applies even on a foreign policy term. I thought I had a bit more hope with uh, Admiral Moffitt, but I'm not actually sure that the, the what to do with is, has an answer there too. One of the answers I got when I was asked, why are you buying a 12 submarine outside of Australia? Oh, it's because Australia no longer has any capacity to build ships. So there's a lot of confusion out there. And I think that's a pretty nasty comment I had from an Australian, by the way. But anyway, this common thread about what are we doing with and what for? What is the, the underlying government policy in order to make use of your ship? It's extraordinarily worrisome considering the, the world we live in. Uh, one would have hoped that a government would have a, a clear foreign policy and a clear defense policy and a clear, stra you know, a national strategy. So I'd love to have comments from all of you. Thank you. The point that I made about the why was, was particularly relevant um, in the submarine question, uh, simply because of the fact that um, I discovered that I didn't know myself. I didn't understand really why. And, and uh, that was, for, for someone who'd had the senior positions in the RAN that I had had, that was a very embarrassing aha moment, let me tell you. The worst moment came when I realised that I was not alone on the island. In fact, it was heavily populated with people who didn't know either. And the question's easy to answer, actually, when you sit down and think about it. But that's not necessarily the point. The point is, you've got to specify at the beginning what you want, um, and you've got to understand why you want that. And, and so, what are the missions for the vessel? Th these are sort of these are fundamental questions. But if you don't do that right at the beginning, then you are doomed. You really are. Set the specification before you put a pen on paper to do a design or a keystroke on the CAD uh, to begin the design. If, you, if your designer doesn't know what you want because you don't know what you want. And increasingly uh, in the complexity of the circumstances that we face uh, in respect of our evolving strategic circumstances, it's right that we should go back and challenge uh, some of the notions that we have, some of which are, many of which I think are uh, sort of mired in in history, you know, I, 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 the strong sense I get from talking to people about submarines is that when you start to talk submarines, you get Hollywood. You know, um, you didn't get much about submarines really in Hunt for Red October. The last one was Dust Bolt. You know, that's what you get. That's what submarines do. Well, you know what? Uh, no, it's not. Not anymore. Um, and, uh, and equally, although perhaps to a less extent, uh, understanding what you want your frigate to do. And I talk ASW sometimes and I hear the Battle of the Atlantic being played to me. That's not ASW today. Uh, it, and if it is, then the problem is far more serious than I thought. 
Next question. Can I uh, make a comment? Yep, on absolutely. That? Um, I think that uh, the whole idea of uh, making sure that you know what you want to build is kind of fundamental where I come from. You're what you know. You're going to build a, a ship for something, and you got to know what it is. Okay. And I, I said that. I, I tried to say that in my presentation, but I. I think it's more than that. You know, I don't recall in my 39 years in the military where we actually had a government defense plan that laid out what the Navy was supposed to do, okay? What the Navy has done traditionally is give the government the Navy that the, the, the Navy has designed the Navy that it thinks the government wants. And the government doesn't know what it wants, so it, it's kind of worked fairly well up till now. But uh, I, I don't know whether, uh, for instance, um, anybody, you know, and, uh, you know, we were, let me put it another way, we were spoiled up until about 1990 uh, when uh, the enemy took the red armband with the hammer and sickle off and our enemy had gone. Like, where the heck did he go? Uh, so now we are like, we, we normally have been time immemorial without any known enemy till we actually get in a fight. Uh, who would have in uh, the year 2000 or the year, uh, you know, 1995 depicted the morass we're in in Africa and uh, Asia Pacific? Uh, no, I don't care what kind of a competent planner you had trying to build naval vessels, would he ever got it right? Uh, and I don't even know whether there is a naval vessel right now when you're trying to deal with those things that's right. But the fact is, is that you, you have to build a vessel, you have to decide what it's going to do, the government's got to make that decision, then you've got to go out and get the best one you can for the money that you've got. And then, if you have a fairly general capability and good training, you'll be able to get through most uh, things that you're going to deal with. That's my view anyway. Hi, Commodore. Uh, my name's Guy Stitt, and I'm with AMI International, and I, uh, I have a couple of I think uh, why you're building ships is you're a maritime nation. I hope that remains. Some ideas is we, we work with shipbuilders all around the world, and uh, when we see Dahman's approach, uh, while they're so successful in the export market, is, is they're building their holes in a much lower cost uh, country in Romania. And they bring those holes back up to Holland and do selective outfitting, testing, integration, and delivery there. And so I would suggest that perhaps Canada could cooperate with other Commonwealth uh, nations and take a similar approach. So why not, why not buy a yard in uh, Korea and uh, have them build your, build your holes and bring them up here and do the value added that really creates the high tech jobs. So that, that's a way to save money. And if you're looking at a destroyer that takes about four million man hours, you, you'd probably save 30, 30% 30% off the top of your price. So there's, there's, there's probably a, a number of ways that Canada could approach maintaining a strong Navy and a strong industrial base, but taking just a different approach on what gets built here and what doesn't. So uh, I, I, I heard in that question um, the essence of value proposition and whether shipbuilding in Canada actually is a valued um, industry. So Harry, would you like to take a, a stab at it, 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 is the work that we're going to do with the NSPS in both uh, C-SPAN and Irving uh, of value to Canadian industry? And is it, I, I guess that's the first question that we need to answer is if there's value there, then the government gets to decide whether they want to pursue the value. But it, is the, the normal shipbuilding activity, does that bring value into the, the marine industry here in Canada? Yeah, I think definitely. Uh, <clears throat> as I explained in my presentation, uh, commercial uh, shipbuilding, in commercial shipbuilding, productivity is extremely high. That's because, as I already explained, not because of operational efficiency, but because their design is so efficient. Design is the key. I, in my opinion, design engineering, including uh, design for production, is the core of our industry. Not because of operational uh, efficiency, but because of design. That is the core of our business. So, 
Uh, actually, I think that this principle could be applied to any kind of shipbuilding, either commercial ships, naval shipbuilding, it doesn't matter. That's my view. Uh, actually, building ships, uh, in my opinion, is more or less the same, very similar. Uh, actually, ship type, different than ship type is, is not that important. Either building commercial ships, either building naval ships, we could apply the same principle. So, so then, in my understanding of the response to the, the question is that the value is actually in, in the systems engineering, in the design engineering, and the quality of the engine, engineering work that goes into the design that helps to build a reputation internationally that could, in fact, position can Canadian shipbuilding industries to be competitive internationally as well. Yeah, I think so. Uh, actually, if, uh, for example, in the auto car industry, operational efficiencies are very important because they are building, based on one design, world record, 40 million cars. That's the Toyota Corolla, 40 million cars. Second, Ford FC is 36 million. But in our industry, we are building based on one design, average two ships. So operational efficiency is still important, but we cannot do much about that because we have not enough time to evolve our operational aspects. So the most important thing for us is to focus on engineering. And this is a benefit because engineering operational aspect is very difficult to improve. But engineering aspect, a lot of easy, because uh, to improve engineering uh, aspects, we need to put some supermans, not many people. I think less than 10 people, or three people. In, in uh, C-SPAN, we have a, 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 about uh, less than 10 good people. We could change all the designs. I think that is possible. No need to have 100 or 1,000 engineers. We need less than 10 people. Then we could change dramatically. Anybody else on the panel want to pick up on the um, issue of value? Yeah, I pick up on it because uh, it seems to me, I look at this in a very fundamental and perhaps too simplistic way. But if there's no value to Canada in shipbuilding and design and all that things, that means there's value to somebody else. And why shouldn't we get it? It's that simple. Because if we get it, we can then leverage that to other things. If we don't get it and we don't do it and we don't take the value, then somebody else takes the value, takes the profit, and does the leveraging on their own behalf. So uh, doing it that way, to me, makes us uh, a loser, really, to be very truthful. Next question. Hello. Uh, my name is Wade Carter. I'm with Navy Requirements. Uh, my question is for Mr. Kim. You uh, seized my attention with your uh, drawings. Uh, I know it's probably somewhat obscure, but I'm a Leafs fan and I tend to ask obscure questions and focus on things with faint success, faint hope of success. But so in particular, my, my question, my concern is tweaked by the remark you said that some of the design changes you look at bringing to the designs uh, will improve efficiencies, right? And so uh, in my experience, I'm a little bit wary of that term because if you increase efficiencies quite often you reduce effectiveness. Uh, one of the advantages of the offshore designs that were pursued for JSS, for example, the, the military off-the-shelf designs was that they're proven designs, right? And that, uh, that several of those ships have been constructed and tested now. And you're now, you're speaking about potentially introducing design changes, and I get it, going with a, a, a higher grade of steel makes eminent sense to me, for example. Um, but are, how are you measuring through life costs for maintenance and, and things like that that'll be passed on to the Navy uh, for th the through life of the, of the vessel? Uh, and secondarily, how, how do you ensure that, that uh, the design changes don't impact the design quality uh, on build? Because again, I'll use GSS as an example. As you stated, it's difficult to achieve efficiencies when you're only building two of a particular class, right? So right off the bat, 50% of the class will be prototype, right? So to introduce additional design changes uh, would seem to introduce risk to me. I'm just curious your perspective on that. Yeah, thanks for your <clears throat> very good question. Uh, 
When I talk about the design for production, many people uh, give me a similar question. Uh, this is not the first time. Actually, my background is not a, a production engineering. I'm naval architect, and my, uh, my specialty is hydrodynamics, not production engineering. I'm hydrodynamist. Uh, many people worry about uh, if we uh, talk about production engineering, we are thinking, we are focusing only on productivity. That's totally wrong. If you could clearly uh, see my presentation material, actually a little bit far away, you cannot see clearly, you could see the difference. Even though we put it design for production, it's not only for design for productivity, it's for quality, it's for maintenance. Uh, for chain locker case, I showed it previous case, uh, original case, it's very difficult for us to apply welding and painting. That means it's also difficult for maintenance. Actually, design for production means not only for design for product, uh, productivity only. Uh, as I already mentioned to you, it's more close to uh, elegant design. That means not only for productivity, also quality, maintenance, performance, all other aspects at the same time. Many people believe that uh, to design something for performance or man, uh, uh, maintenance, we make it very sophisticated way. That's not not case in, in practice. Usually, if something uh, easy to build, usually better in quality and performance. I can guarantee that. And I, actually, I had some difficulty with talking with JSS project. Actually, there is a project for us at the moment. We started our initial design review already last week. I'm thinking, of, uh, thinking about the applying design for production changes to, to the vessels. Uh, but I could say that no need to sacrifice quality performance, maintain, maintainability, environmental protection, all other things. We could, apply, uh, we could obtain design for production, productivity, at the same time, we could guarantee good performance, quality, and then other things. I could guarantee that. Thank you. Can I give you a for instance, perhaps? Go back to my story about um, Australia building FFGs. So we hadn't built anything for 20 years. We had a government-owned naval shipbuilding yard awarded a contract to build two US-designed FFG-7 class ships. We said to the US Navy who owns the design, this is what we want to do, they gave us the design. And we started building the ship. And in the space of two years, we were two years late. We sold the yard. The new people who came in did a whole bunch of things, one of which they, they uh, needed to do, which was, for the first time, they went to Todd. Todd built the FFGs for the US Navy. And they said, show us your drawings of how you build this thing. And the drawings were all marked up. They had the same US Navy drawings, but they were marked up for production. So they had done engineering work on the drawings to design how they were going to build it. Yeah? As they went into the Anzac ship program, that shipyard did the same thing. They had something in the vicinity of 100 plus engineers and designers working with Miko in Germany, designing our ship, which was different from everyone else's in the world because we're special. Um, <laughs> Uh, designing for production. So they knew how they were going to build it, design for production. Fast forward to the Air Warfare Destroyer, we brought the designs off Navantia, and guess what? We didn't do it. Why didn't we do it? Because we'd forgotten everything that we had learned in t it's two and a half successful shipbuilding programs, all about design for production. In Navantia, it works really well because the building yard is right next door to the design house. In Australia, there's a big gap, not to mention language and not to mention what we bought, which was not what we needed. Actually, the design examples I showed in my presentation, uh, when I proposed these changes 
to the engineers. I've had a lot of resistance. They are not happy with. They, don't want, they didn't want to change in the latest stage. But I very strongly insist because if we did not change now, what will happen on operations? What will happen? Our operation people, our production people will suffer a lot. That's for nothing. Only suffering. No value added. I, I have a lot of resistance, not only from my colleagues, even for senior people, from senior people. They don't like it. But I insisted because I know it very well. Because I have designed until now more than 3,000 vessels, you know? 3,000, can you imagine? I know it very, to me, very clear. But for them, not clear. That's the problem. Derek Davis, another naval architect in Victoria. Uh, with respect to your last comment, Mr. Kim, we've been hearing a lot about how the, shall I say, private industry is coping with the 20-year downturn that uh, Admiral Cairns talked about. One of the other concerns you brought up was the fact that no one in government has been associated with that. So what I am seeing is a shipyard, and, and I guess Mr. Kim personifies it, is finding ways to do things in an innovative way, coming up with new modern build strategies. But if I look upon myself as the last of the people who worked on CPF and Trump, and there's no one after us, who do you find in government that knows what you're speaking about? Right, so that raises the, the question of national capacity. And uh, so before I let the, the, the panel, we'll treat this as the last question of the day because this, in fact, is the nugget, uh, I think, that we're, that we're all facing. And I think the issue uh, th that you've asked is, is, is one of governance, program performance. Um, the guys in NDHQ that are literally writing the specification to the TSOR, what's the experience level with those guys? But it's also in, in PWGSC in the contracting authority with the guys who are, are overseeing the contract and writing the checks. What's their experience level in order to deliver on a, a program that is of, of some strategic importance to the government? So the, the issue becomes is whether or not this is a Navy program or it's in fact a national ship procurement strategy which means that the ownership might necessarily not reside where you think it should reside in order to drive procurement, in order to drive success. And so for your final comments, we'll start with uh, the shipbuilder at the end and then come all the way back to, to Admiral Cairns, is based on your experience, what changes should we put in place or need to be considered to put in place to deliver on a successful procurement that reaches well beyond the welding and well beyond the, the technical specifications and actually delivers success for Canada from a national ship procurement perspective? Very difficult question. Uh, I think uh, both ship shipbuilding industry and uh, Canada should change. Uh, for shipyard, uh, as uh, Canada already asked, the, uh, we shipbuilders to become a world-class shipbuilder according uh, under the uh, target state requirement. I think it's, a, it's the right way. So shipyard try to uh, develop uh, their capability and finally reach to the world-class level. In my opinion, world-class level means world-class engineering capability. To make it simple, engineering is the core. That's my view. And for the Canada, I think uh, 
we need to learn from commercial sector. Uh, I think the biggest, actually, I don't like to mention like this, is that I think the biggest difference between commercial sector and government practice is, I think, uh, uh, kind of bureaucracies. Uh, actually, it, it's not only related to government, it only, also in our shipyard. Uh, to my eyes, in our shipyard, people spend a lot of time for meeting. More than 50% of our time we spend on meeting. In my opinion, it's all waste, non-value added to my eyes. First, personally, I usually do not organize meeting myself. When I had something to talk, I just approach. I make it just on the spot to talk and discuss. And usually do not send email. I think email and uh, uh, meeting, I think is a big problem we have. So not only engineering, we must try to focus all our activities based on value added. Whether my activity will value added or not. We must consider like that. I think this is very important. Uh, in my opinion, uh, our contract, our contract practice, uh, make it simple, a little bit complicated. As I already mentioned in my presentation, we are based on piecewise contract. I think it, we need to improve this. We try to uh, make a uh, contract more project basis, not piecewise. Initial design, uh, design review, uh, initial design package, functional design, they are all separate, isolated. I think it, with this kind of practice, we cannot uh, build a ship uh, efficiently. I think uh, cannot, uh, government also need to learn from uh, efficient uh, commercial sectors, I think. I think I would say challenge every fundamental. Challenge every sacred cow. I'll give you for instance. Um, we, we build our ships, they're expensive, we keep them 30 years. Somewhere during that period of time, they're not going to meet up well with a potential adversary's capability, so we do an upgrade. Uh, the upgrades in our experience uh, are a number of things. Uh, they're more or less successful, and we've had both. Um, they take ships out of service for a long time. They cost a lot of money. Sometimes they cost, in real dollar terms, more than the initial acquisition cost. And as I say, sometimes they work well and sometimes they don't work so well at all. Don't do it. So we don't build for 30 years. We don't do upgrades. We build for 20 years and we do a major refit in the middle. The quick and dirty costing comparison that I did in the future submarine program based on that model you simply, and this is comparing um, acquisition cost uh, and uh, re um, in addition to in the 30 year model with major upgrade one or two during its life, the cost of doing that. Um, the saving that you might generate from a shorter life uh, with more or less continuous upgrades as you go, but no major in build, but no major upgrades in service is somewhere between 5 and 8%. You will save money. Not only will you save money, you will generate a higher rate of demand on industry. Rather than building 12 frigates or 15 or 16 or whatever it is that you build as fast as you can possibly turn them out because that's industrially efficient and then shutting up shop for the next 20 years, uh, don't do that either. Build them slower, deliver them regularly but not frequently don't upgrade them in service, scrap them at 20 years or something. That's not rocket science, that's the Japanese model. Why do you need, what, and somewhere in there is an answer about, we really need to have two shipyards? Can we sustain and support two shipyards? The Japanese submarine model sustains and supports two submarine building yards continuously. Their, their operational fleet is 16 submarines. They actually have a couple of training boats, but that's the model. They sign a contract for a new submarine every 12 to 18 months. Challenge every, every fundamental. Question all of the basics except no sacred cows.
Uh, I think I don't have very much to say after those two. Uh, I, uh, but knowing me, I always have to say something. Um, I would like to go back to uh, Mr. Kim's point about commercial. Uh, I think that all the incredible production and design breakthroughs we've had in the shipbuilding industry in the last 15 to 20 years come from the commercial side. There are, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we uh, design neat gadgets to put inside our ships, but the actual design, the building process, the engineering process and everything comes from the commercial world. What I mean, we always, you know, the Koreans, uh, you know, they were building in docks and then they decided, well, why do we have to build in a dock? Dock costs a lot of money, so we'll just build them on the beach and we'll just rotate them along and eventually they fall out. The way they did, we used to do years ago in the Lakers. Uh, you know, nothing is, nothing is sacred. You've got to really have an open mind and some people who are just trying to think, I hate this word, think outside the box, but think a little differently, okay? Because I've been looking for the box and I haven't been able to find it, so. Uh, uh, but, you know, I think there, there's so many things we can do. There's so many ways we can make money. If we were just able to convince the government to cut on, down its requirements that the shipbuilder has to provide for the government oversight uh, by 50%, we'd probably save a few million there. You know, there are all sorts of costs that are put on to us by people who are well-meaning but aren't concerned about the ship's efficiency. They're not uh, how we build it. They're not concerned about whether the sailors get a, a really good ship or not. They're just concerned that their little bit, okay, is, is uh, they've complied with their rules and regulations. We need to get around away from that stuff. We've got to get away from these incredible restrictions that are restricting our really some really good people from actually exerting their, uh, their uh, you know, flapping their wings and starting to fly. Uh, and I'll close with this. There is a brand new movie out, okay, on Admiral Rickover, the father of the nuclear navy. I saw it in the Parliament buildings in Ottawa about four days ago, five days ago. Um, if you want to have a look at somebody who grabbed a problem by the uh, lower band, as we used to say in the Navy, and got on with it, that's the one to see, because that's the kind of model uh, you need to be looking at. You don't have to be a martinet like he was, but you have to have a vision, and you have to be driving towards it. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, Kelly, I think that Yeah, Mike O'Sullivan, uh, Royal Navy UK, um, and it's a, a word, a, a wary cautionary tale here. Um, the panacea is commercial build and export. We've heard a lot about this. 30 years ago, the Royal Navy had a commercial f warships, and they exported their design as well. Half of that navy is sitting in the bottom of San Carlos water. Right. That brings to a close the uh, panel on uh, building uh, our future fleets. And on your behalf, I'd like to thank the panel for, the, uh, for their presentations and your questions. And so please join me in thanking them. <laughs>